Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security, and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding expertise results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world, education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism, alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations, rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. After the shooting last year in Noblesville, school safety is a top priority for state lawmakers. Several proposals would give schools more money for security, but those grants can only go so far. So this can cost up to $20,000 a year uh, to, to, to conduct that training. That's what it cost us. Lawmakers are also looking at ways to keep kids safe on their way to school. Just ahead, lawmakers are proposing new rules for drivers and loading zones. And we meet a man who travels to cemeteries across Indiana to etch names and death dates on headstones and monuments. I'm the one that do the last thing on people's lives. Put their date or name on the stone after that. Just go put some flowers. Those stories plus the latest news headlines from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. State legislators are considering multiple proposals that would give districts access to more money for security improvements. As Barbara Brozier reports, one superintendent thinks schools should be able to use some of it for gun training. As Alyssa Mann works at this Portland nail salon, a picture of her family hangs behind her. I have two little girls. The oldest one is five, her name's Brindley, and then my youngest one is Lainey, and she's three. Her oldest will go to a Jay County Elementary School in the fall. And the change is one man isn't quite ready for. She feels so little to be in that big school. And then like when you hear about shootings, I'm like, I can't even imagine like the thoughts, you know, I would be so sick. They're on the minds of many across the state. And especially Jay Schools Superintendent Jeremy Gully. He studies the incidents closely. We're applying what we learn uh, to how to prevent these things from happening. The district spent nearly $1.3 million over the past year to try and increase student safety and prevent an incident from happening here. It means establishing single points of entry at every school. In this school, you could just be buzzed in, uh, but you could have access to the school. That's changing now. So we have a single point of entry where you get buzzed in three different times before you can access the school. And the heartbreaking reality of being a student in 2019 is illustrated in subtle details throughout this elementary school. Windows placed high enough so people can't see inside. Color-coded carpet in a first grade classroom so the teacher can tell students to go to the dark blue carpet when the school's on lockdown. The one thing we're anxiously awaiting is our bulletproof classroom doors. Uh, those are special order. Uh, and those will, those will be here within the next month. The district is also completing the installation of biometric gun safes in its schools, which some staff members who volunteered will have access to in the event of a shooting. They underwent specialized firearms training to prepare. So this can cost up to $20,000 a year uh, to, to, to conduct that training. That's what it cost us. The district had to find that money in its own budget because the state's school safety grants can only be used for certain improvements. Republican State Senator Jim Toms is proposing a bill this year that would expand how schools can use those matching funds. I would like to see that that funding is available for that portion of the school safety projects that they're implementing, such as the training farm training for this. 
But the state superintendent of public instruction, Jennifer McCormick, has repeatedly said, although state law allows it, she doesn't think arming teachers is a good idea. House Speaker Brian Bosma indicated this week Republicans will focus on local flexibility when it comes to school safety. We'll continue to emphasize both school physical safety and mental health services. Where that funding will go is something the women at this Jay County nail salon care a lot about. Most of them have children or grandchildren in local schools. Brenda Fennig says providing money for teachers to get gun training is something she supports. I believe that it's okay to have a gun with a qualified person that's been trained in it. He needs to wear it on his body. He can't have it locked up somewhere and go get it when somebody's in there shooting your kids. That's something Mann tries to put out of her mind as she thinks about sending her daughters to school in the near future. Every night I just pray that, like, keep my babies healthy and watch over them every day. I mean, so much happens. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Barbara Brozier. There are several other school safety proposals legislators will consider. One would allow districts to raise money for security improvements through referenda. Another focuses on implementing changes recommended in a school safety report several state agencies authored earlier this year. Now, Governor Eric Holcomb laid out his education funding proposal this week and includes a 2% funding increase per year for schools in the next two years. It also cuts the state's teacher appreciation grants, which provide bonus monthly to highly rated teachers. And House Republican leader Brian Bosma says his caucus will push legislation to establish a goal. 85% of school spending from the tuition support fund should go into the classroom, which largely means teacher pay. There will be a, a publication of those schools that are reaching the goal and those schools that are not reaching the goal, so local communities will know. And the Indiana Black Legislative Caucus agrees with Republicans on boosting teacher pay as well. They say local districts have done all they can, and the state needs to take a more active role in helping increase teacher salaries. I think it's incumbent upon the General Assembly to find the dollars to support them in that effort. Melton says that could include direct grants for teacher pay. Family members of three students who were struck and killed on their way to a bus stop in October joined legislators this week to call for safety improvements. As Jeannie Lindsay reports, lawmakers are looking at ways to keep kids safe as they travel to and from school. Michael Schwab is the grandfather of the three children struck and killed in October. Schwab says illegally passing a school bus should be treated as seriously as drunk driving. In my eyes, this offense is on a par with DUI. Senate Bill 2 would increase the penalties for drivers who violate the law, especially in cases where someone is injured. For example, a driver who recklessly passes a bus with its stop arm out and injures someone could be charged with a level 6 felony. The driver of the vehicle that killed the three children told police she didn't know the stopped vehicle was a school bus. Schwab says, especially in situations when people get hurt, the driver should also lose their privileges until an investigation can be completed. We should suspend licenses until the entire event is completed and we understand why it happened. Data from the Department of Education shows during a single day last year in Indiana, more than 3,000 drivers illegally passed school buses. Right now, the bill doesn't include anything about taking licenses away, but it would allow schools to petition for lower speed limits near bus stops and limit stops on busy roads. Senator Randy Head represents Fulton County, where the children were killed, and authored the bill. He says it will likely be amended, possibly to include language from a proposal by Representative Jim Pressel to equip school buses with stop arm cameras. It could also focus on driver education. Superintendents uh, from across the state have uh, come to me with the idea of having the BMV test people on school bus safety laws when they get their first driver's licenses and every time they renew a driver's license throughout their lives. It has yet to be scheduled for an initial hearing, but several other lawmakers have already shown their support, with two more joining on as co-authors of the bill. 
For Indiana News Desk, I'm Jeannie Lindsay. A coalition of more than 700 advocates who want the legislature to pass a hate crimes bill say Indiana can't wait any longer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not time to compromise the most frequently targeted victims, as we have data from the FBI. Most of the hate crimes bills this session include a list of victim characteristics like age, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, and military service. Now for headlines, we go over to Alex Eady, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thanks, Joe. The Monroe County Health Department is offering a vaccination clinic next week for anyone who may have been exposed to hepatitis A at the Bloomington Buffalo Wild Wings restaurant. The health department confirms an employee at the restaurant was recently diagnosed with hepatitis A. Health officials encourage anyone who ate at the restaurant from January 2nd to January 6th to get the vaccine. It must be administered within two weeks of being exposed. Indiana's newly elected Senator Mike Braun introduced his first bill this week. The no budget, no pay bill would prevent members of Congress from getting paid during a government shutdown. Braun says he supports President Trump's request for a $5.7 billion wall along the border with Mexico. Pharmaceutical company Catalan is planning a $100 million expansion in Bloomington. The New Jersey-based company bought the Bloomington facility in 2017 from Cook Pharmaca. As Sean Hogan reports, Catalan officials say the expansion will create up to 200 new jobs. The drug company's Bloomington division focuses on biologics manufacturing, which are drugs made from living cells instead of chemicals, the kind of drugs that could help people suffering from autoimmune disorders or cancer. Indiana ranks top five in the nation in life science exports. General Manager Ryan Hawkins says the Cook Group's legacy of medical device advancement made Bloomington the perfect location for Catalan's new division to flourish. We're continuing what is a leadership position in the field that we're, that we're in, the business that we're in, um, right here in Bloomington, Indiana. It's a, it's a gem of a site, and um, we're doing a lot of good uh, for a lot of patients out there. Catalan currently has 900 employees in Bloomington. It hopes to add 200 more jobs by 2024. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Sean Hogan. Indiana had a banner year for solar installations. The state is projected to have installed more than 140 megawatts, mostly from large utility scale projects. Experts say we are likely to see more large scale projects in the future. Two companies have proposed large solar farms. The price of solar has dropped about 70 percent over the last six years. Vigo County commissioners are looking outside the Terre Haute city limits for a new jail location. Last month, the city council denied a rezoning request for a location inside the city. Officials say looking for a place outside of the city removes the rezoning obstacle. Little disappointed with that. I think it needs to be as centrally located as possible, and I'm sure West Terre Haute Police, ISU Police, everybody else would agree with us that we need to be able to get to the jail with those that are arrested as quick as we can and get back on the streets. He says the city would need to add at least two patrol cars on the street in order to process an arrestee outside the city. A federal judge has ordered regular progress reports on plans for the new jail after determining conditions at the current jail are unconstitutional. A new poll shows Hoosiers overwhelmingly support an increased cigarette tax. Out of 600 Hoosiers polled last month, 7 in 10 say they support a $2 cigarette tax increase. Smoking rates in the state ticked up slightly last year to nearly 22 percent. The last time Indiana increased its tax, cigarette tax was in 2007. Indianapolis hospitals are imposing temporary restrictions on visitors in an attempt to prevent the spread of the flu. The restrictions include no visitors with symptoms of influenza, no visitors under the age of 18, and visitors limited to immediate family. IU Health Bloomington Hospital also has imposed visiting restrictions in women's and children's services, but it's because of a seasonal respiratory virus that can cause inflammation in the lungs in premature babies. The best way to, to prevent the illness is by, um, if you're feeling ill, trying to stay away from the hospital or trying to stay away from um, particularly vulnerable, a particularly vulnerable population. 
He says the best preventative measure is to wash your hands. Salvage crews are working to lift nine coal barges out of the Ohio River this week. The barges got stuck on a dam near Louisville on Christmas night. All but two of those barges have sunk. The investigation into the accident is still ongoing. And a Brown County business will host the community's first ever gaming conference this year. Toy chest owner Hillary Key says retail shifts and a huge increase in game sales over the last couple of years encouraged her to come up with the idea. For a lot of people, you think Toy Store, you automatically think kids, um, when realistically you should never stop playing. You know, play does such great things for our brains, both as kids and as adults. The conference will offer games for toddlers up to strategy style games for adults. The event is scheduled for the last weekend in March. Key says she hopes it will become an annual event. I like her advice. That's a great idea. We should keep playing, right? Yeah, everybody looks at their car game. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Thank you. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Officials are reaching out to residents about plans for a new bridge that will span the Ohio River, linking I-69 between Indiana and Kentucky. And we'll follow one Hoosier who has carved out a unique career in the state. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same. And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing. For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. The WTIU WFIU news team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU news team is where you are and telling your story. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Transportation officials are considering routes for a new I-69 toll bridge that will extend across the Ohio River connecting Indiana and Kentucky. As Alex Eady reports, area residents are worried about plans to toll drivers to help fund the $1.5 billion project. This week's public hearing gave Indiana and Kentucky residents the chance to weigh in on the proposed route of the Ohio River Crossing Bridge. Transportation officials are working together to evaluate the cost and potential impacts of the project. It's going to be continuing financial analysis. It's going to be that federal grant availability, how much money is available at the federal level for this project, and then the public feedback. So it's very important as we continue this decision-making process. The project team is recommending Central Alternative 1. It calls for tearing down the southbound U.S. Highway 41 Twin Bridge and building a new four-lane I-69 toll bridge a bit to the east. In order to help fund the project, the team is studying whether drivers would have to pay a toll to use the remaining Twin Bridge. Many residents spoke in favor of the project, touting efforts to enhance safety and connectivity. But almost all community members prefer no tolls on Highway 41. Other residents feel the project will benefit large corporations, but doesn't appeal to underrepresented populations. I particularly came out because I feel like a lot of people, like just of my like socioeconomic class, are not necessarily like represented here. The public comment period continues through February 8th online. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Alex Eady. Names and dates are etched on the majority of gravestones before they're installed in cemeteries. But when someone dies after a stone has been set, the monument has to be engraved on site. As Tyler Lake reports, an Indiana man travels the state to etch in history the final word for hundreds of Hoosiers. Guy Blanchett has been painstakingly engraving headstones in the Hoosier State since the early 80s. But the Canadian-born engraver learned his trade at a monument company on the East Coast when he was only 17 years old. I got a job there as a stone cutter, stone polisher, and stone carver. And I learned from the Italians. I mean, the Italians, they were good. After a while, uh, there was no, no advancement. Uh, you can't make so much money, and that's it. So uh, when I knew how to engrave stones, I'm going to start doing some engraving. And, and, and there was too many people doing it. 
and all the Italian was doing it. So I decided to come here in 1982 in Indiana, and uh, it, it, it exploded from there. He started out working for a monument company in Indiana, but always with the hope of doing the work on his own. And uh, they went under in 1985, so I bought all the equipment and all the accounts came with it. So now Guy travels across the state, a large air compressor for sandblasting in tow. He carefully measures and applies stencils to prepare for the sandblasting process. It's exacting work, but Guy says sometimes he gets to work on intricate pieces that test his years of experience. The biggest one I ever did is the one in uh, Troy, Ohio. Did that about four years ago. It's like a pyramid monument and stuff. There was all kinds of design that they designed themselves, and I had to go there and put it together. He's in high demand and waits until the cemetery has at least a handful of jobs before he comes and knocks them all out in a single trip. I, I probably say I do about 90% of Indianapolis. But he isn't keeping all that business to himself. He's showing his grandson the craft, hoping one day he'll be part of the family business. My, my two sons are doing this, this, the same thing. I got one son who lives in North Vernon, does the same thing. I've got my other son lives uh, in Indianapolis, but near Brownsburg. He does all Buchanan Group's work over here, mostly all the, all the groundwork. He says he's happy that his children and now grandchildren have followed in his footsteps and are keeping the craft alive. It, it is a dying art. A lot of people don't know how to do it. And the thing is, today, you can't just go out and say, I'm going to do this. You have to work in the shop for a few years to learn the basic, you know, how, how to engrave. If you don't do this, you can't start on your own. You'll mess it up. And uh, most of the people that work in the monument shop don't get paid that much. It's hard to get started. He says while it pays well, it's the effect on others' lives that gives his work value to him. I'm the one that do the last thing on people's lives, put their date or name on the stone. After that, just go put some flowers. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Tyler Lake. 2018 was a good year for Indiana breweries. 32 opened in the state. Azra Jalen reports on how breweries are working to differentiate themselves in a competitive market. A brewery like this has been a dream for Curtis Cummings for years. And so 2018 just happened to be the year that it actually, like all the pieces fell together um, in the right places. Switchyard Brewing Company opened in Bloomington eight months ago. The space is a big improvement from where Cummings started. We started it in our two-car garage. Switchyard is one of nearly three dozen breweries that opened in the state last year. Because of the increase in competition, Cummings says breweries need to create a strong identity. One of the industry trends that I'm seeing right now is that breweries have to be unique. You can't, the days are gone where you can just open your brewery, immediately get put on store shelves, immediately find tap handle accounts. Switchyard tries to balance a community business model with larger scale production. Even a six-year-old's birthday has been celebrated here in our tap room. And I think that is very hyper-local, right? I mean, um, but uh, you know, we have a 15-barrel brew house, which is pretty large. Hoosiers can expect to see the brewery boom continue this year. According to the craft beer marketing company Indiana on Tap, about 22 craft breweries are already slated to open in 2019. Cummings says he thinks there's still room for more due to the industry's collaborative nature. We, we all still have this common goal, you know, to increase craft, to get people to taste craft beer, to learn about craft beer. You know, to think about beer isn't just something that's yellow and fizzy. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Azra Jalan. And the resurgence of bald eagles in the U.S. is considered a major success story. As Lindsay Wright reports, part of the credit also goes to people who help rehabilitate the birds and then reacclimate them to the wild. 17 feet in the air, surrounded by trees and a large pond. Not a bad view. This eagle hacking tower, nicknamed Friendship Tower, sits on a highly secluded part of Lola and Rick Nicholson's property. They constructed it last summer with the help of a number of volunteers. It has two large wooden cages where eagles come to stay after spending time at a rehabilitation center. The raptor centers are starting to feel the impact of birds that are in trouble. They used to have zero eagles. And then last year they had seven in Brown County that had been injured or sick. The goal is to reintroduce the eagles to the wild over the course of a week or two. 
The tower allows the birds to get away from people and soak up the nature. A handful of cameras surround the tower, allowing the Nicholsons to monitor the birds 24-7 so they can keep them safe. They let us know when they're ready. They get very active, they're very flighty, and when they get to that point, and we know that they're good and healthy, they're filled up with food, we open the door and let them leave on their own. She says people cause the majority of problems eagles run into, so she feels an obligation to help as much as possible. So far, they've released five eagles and some owls from the tower. It makes me cry every time. <laughs> people have gotten to the point, point where they laugh at me because it does. It's such a joyful feeling. But Nicholson says they put out food on perch poles, like this deer leg, for example, so the eagles know they have a place to come back to if they still need a little help. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Lindsay Wright. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online at WTIUNews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security, and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding expertise results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. The IU School of Education, preparing teachers, scholars, and administrators to improve teaching in Indiana and around the world. Education.indiana.edu. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.